We have been steadily going through the Gospels, the four books in the New Testament that tell us the biography, the life, and the, the ministry of Jesus. And one of the most fascinating things I have taken away so far in our time doing this this year is that uh, we see this example of Jesus, the perfect one, the, 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 the sinless one, the flawless, spotless lamb, doing these works of ministry, and then he uh, commissions and expects us to do the same. And it's, it's just mind-blowing that we would be but dust. We just, just vessels, earth and clay, and yet God would give to us his same spirit, empowering us to do the very same things that he has done. This year, 2022, is the year of the good news here at New Freedom Church. There's plenty of bad news out there, and so we just wanted to focus on the good news, and therefore we're going to camp out uh, this entire year in the Gospels, and today we're going to be finishing up the fourth chapter of the book of Luke. We're going to be in Luke for a few more weeks here before we get into the book of John, but uh, the, the thing that I'm really focusing on today is uh, I would call this message today the most surprising church service in history. We're going to look at the most surprising service in history. And it's not just surprising for what was said, but it's more surprising for the actions after the service. You've all been in church services, I'm sure, that, that something has been said or done that just uh, it either caused a laugh or it may have caused some uncomfortability. And, and uh, you know, I really wrestled this morning with sharing with you a few of the things that, that uh, I have heard said in church circles and church services. And I'm not going to share them with you on stage. If you get with me after service, I'll share them off stage. I just don't want to put those in your brain for the, for the message. But boy, we've really heard some doozies, haven't we? We've heard some things that really, wow, I mean, can, can be funny at times and can be quite embarrassing when you're on the stage and you, you miss say something, misspeak. And, and I know I've certainly done that myself. Unfortunately, we live in an age where all that's on tape and it can be cataloged and people can go back and, and find it and all that kind of thing. But uh, thanks be to God, he gives us the grace and the mercy, even when we mess up, that he gives us a do-over. How many are glad for a do-over in Jesus today? I'm glad that I got a mulligan with Jesus. Amen. Well, this morning in uh, Luke chapter 4, I want you to, to look at verses 14 through 21. This is uh, after Jesus' temptation in the wilderness. We spent three weeks talking about those temptations. We now want to see what happens after he emerges from this wilderness. I want to take the first few verses and break them down for just a minute. It says, then Jesus returned in power. Everybody say power. But not just any power, the power of the Spirit to Galilee. And news of him went through all the region... And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And it was his custom that he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up for to read. And it was handed to him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened it, he found the place where it was written. Let's just stop there for a moment, and let's look at this. Jesus, having been tempted for 40 days and nights in the wilderness, now emerges from that area. He goes into the area of Galilee. Now, you know, in Bible language, that's like a county. We would look at that as like, like maybe Warren County. Like, like this is our county, Galilee. And it says in all the surrounding region of this Galilean area, this, this territory, he was preaching in their synagogues. He was teaching from day to day and from place to place about the kingdom of God. And Jesus was, was empowered now to do this teaching. And then he comes back to Nazareth, it says, where he was brought up. This was his, his uh, family crew, I guess you could say. This was where he was most familiar. So after having been in the county or the region, now he comes back to the county seat from which he was raised. And he's going to say something interesting about uh, the area that he was raised later on in the text. But it says that he went to the Sabbath... Uh, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, which was his custom. It was customary for Jesus to go and to be in the place where he was when he's getting ready to say this. It's interesting to me that, that Jesus gives to us this example all throughout his earthly ministry, and then we as examples of that, or, or in turn, take that example, and we do the same things. And so it, it was good enough for Jesus to set apart a time in the week that he would Sabbath. Now, Sabbath does not mean church. But it can be, in church, including going to church. But Sabbath is when you do something that is restful, when you give your soul time to catch up with your body. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You've run, run, run all week long. You've been so busy. 
Does anybody else feel like life has more moving parts than you have parts? <laughs> I mean, does it seem like sometimes you're so busy and you're so active and it's like, I just can't quite keep up. I can't catch up. You need a Sabbath. You need a time where everything pauses, everything rests. Pastor Tom said it a minute ago, in the silence, there is something that truly is golden about silence. You know why? Because in our day and our age, there's very little silence. You can, if you live in, in a, a populated area, it's really hard to go to your backyard at 11 o'clock at night and really have any silence because there's probably something that's flying overhead. There's probably someone that's playing music down the road. There's probably something happening that you're not experiencing silence. But truly, a Sabbath is a time to rest, to take inventory, to reallocate things, to, to review the previous week. And Jesus, as was his custom on the Sabbath, took his rest, he took a time for his soul to catch up with his body, for, for everything to kind of be inventory in his life. And one of the key markers that brought Jesus rest was he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. If coming to church is a headache, a burden, a, 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 a mandate for you, then you're not receiving rest when you come to the synagogue or the house of God. You need to, to come into a place where you can receive from the Lord and also give unto God. Worship is not just what we have to receive, but it's what we give unto the Lord. And so it says that this was what he had been doing. And it says here, after 40 days and nights, that Jesus passed these three temptations and he had an encounter in the wilderness. From that encounter, he had an experience of overcoming a temptation. And now from his encounter and experience, he had an empowerment to do something. And this will be the same in your life too. You will be encountered with a test, a temptation, a trial. From that, you have an experience. You now know what the tactics and the strategy of your enemy are because you have experienced what that bombardment feels like. And from that now, you can ask God to give you a strategy of your own to be able to make it through to the next side. The most surprising or shocking, or I'll even say uh, unexpected church service is just about to happen. How many are interested to see what, what it is? All right, I am too. Let's see this. Let's see this. Jesus opens up the book in verse 17, and it was the prophet Isaiah. Now, in their time, they would be handed a scroll, and wherever the last reading was left off, that's where you would start to read. So as a rabbi, as a teacher, Jesus was handed the scroll by the attendant. He opens up the scroll of Isaiah. They would have all heard this before. This would have been very familiar to them. And he stood up now to read, and here's what he said. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. This was the message that day. This was the sermon. This is exactly the mission, the purpose, and the calling upon Jesus' life. And he declares it right out of Holy Scripture. What did we learn earlier in the temptations? That when the, the enemy came a knocking and came offering him something and tempting him, Jesus said, for it is written. He always went back to the word. And so now he is going to frame his message. He's going to frame his life purpose. He is going to frame for us the gospel, the good news in this text right here. Now, now look at verse 20. It says, then he closed the book. He gave it back to the attendant and sat down. That's a pretty short sermon. Now, somebody's saying, preacher, you need to take a page out of Jesus ministry. <laughs> Just sit down. <laughs> Get us out of here. No, there's no, you know, I got to have three points in a poem at least. He closed the book and he sat down and look at this. It says, and all eyes were on him in the synagogue and they were fixed on him. They weren't, they weren't distracted. There was nothing else that had caught their attention, but they were shocked. They were in awe. They could not believe what they had just heard. But Jesus didn't make this up. This was written hundreds of years ago by the prophet Isaiah. Why were they so fascinated? Let's look. It says, and Verse 21, he began to say to them, today, everybody say today. today. This scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is why we are seeing the most surprising, the unexpected, and what I would say somewhat disruptive church service in all of history. It would have been good enough for Jesus just to have read the scroll to hand it back to the attendant and to sit down. 
But apparently, something about the way he read it, something about the authority of his words, something about the force and the magnitude of that Holy Spirit empowerment was different this time. There was a holy boldness that was upon Jesus to say these things. And then when he sat down, we don't have a clear indication exactly where he sat. And I can't verify this in, in uh, all the, the oracles of history, but there are some who believe that there was an empty chair in every synagogue in the first century. Sometimes there were two empty chairs. And one of these empty chairs they believe was reserved for Moses. And others say it was reserved for the Messiah. And I, I don't know where exactly he sat down, but apparently it caught their attention. And if he did sit in that Messiah seat, what he was basically saying was, the time has come. But even not knowing whether he sat in that seat or not, we do know he said this. After he sat down, this scripture today is fulfilled in your ears. Now this was on the same level of him declaring himself to be the fulfillment of this prophecy. This was a messianic prophecy. They all knew that Isaiah had been telling and foretelling about the coming Messiah, the one who was to be the deliverer, the mighty one, the promised one that was to take God's people out of their Egyptian bondage, their spiritual bondage, and into a brand new promised land. And Jesus is saying, this is now fulfilled today. You have seen it done in your very sight. This was revolutionary. This was mind-bending. They had never heard anyone declare it like this before. And yet Jesus, from a seated position, told them that it was fulfilled. Now that's important too, because when the work is done, someone sits down. And what he was saying is, I have come in full fulfillment of this prophecy, and now you are seeing it with your own eyes. This caused quite a stir. So Jesus gives us something here that that if we're not careful, we can miss. We have now the most concise and plain explanation of the good news. There are a lot of different ways to define the word gospel. Technically, it means good news. But I do like this one from Dallas Willard. Here's the, the way that he defines the gospel is the good news of the presence and availability of life in the kingdom now and forever through reliance on Jesus the anointed. Let me ask you a question. When you say yes to Jesus, when does eternal life begin? Does it begin after you die and you go to heaven? No. When you say yes to Jesus, here's good gospel news. Eternal life begins right at that very moment. You are going to live forever. And though your body die, you go on to be with the Lord. We hear it all the time when someone dies and we're standing at a graveside of a loved one that that, uh, we lost someone. You didn't lose them if you know where they are because the Bible tells us to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So in our glorified state, in, in in a time in which we are no longer present in this body, we go on and live forever with God. And so the gospel is the good news of the availability of God's presence, both now and forever. When I look at, at these, these verses and I see what Jesus proclaimed here, the spirit indwelling, Jesus' good news announcement includes at least eight things that he lists here, but the spirit indwelling is now that Jesus' spirit is not only in us, but upon us. Just like Jesus had the spirit dwelling upon him, he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, which is an empowerment. And when something comes upon you, have you ever watched uh, someone in in a sporting event where they, quote unquote, get their second wind? It's like they were tired, they were beaten up, it didn't look like they were ever going to make it through, and somehow something comes upon them, and you're like, whoa, what happened? They got like a second wind, and they get this burst of energy. When the Spirit of God comes upon us, it's as though we have had this second wind come, and now God is empowering us to do something that we hadn't previously been able to do. And then he says, because he has anointed me. Now, anointing is a, 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 uh, I think it's more of a Hebrew term. It's kind of a, a Bible word. But anointing means to rub. They would take the precious ointment in the Old Testament and they would rub or they would anoint the priest with the ointment. If you look at the book of Psalms, it says how precious and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity is like the precious ointment that went upon the head of Aaron and went down on his beard and on his robe and on his garments. And so this anointing has a purpose of empowering us for service. And Jesus is saying, I have been set set apart. I have been sanctified as separated 
from all my other countrymen, from all the other people, because the Spirit of God has given me a mission. And then he goes on and he tells about this mission. He says it is to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, let me just demystify the word preach for all of us, because many people think that preaching takes place on a stage behind a pulpit, that preaching is what someone is hired to do. Preaching is what someone is called and appointed and anointed to do. And that is not wrong, but yet that is very incomplete, because the word preach literally means proclaim. Now, we have, a lot of us, gotten ourselves off the hook of proclaiming the gospel because we say, oh, well, I was never called to be a preacher. Listen, we are all called to do the work of an evangelist. Amen. Not all of us are evangelists, but we are all called to do the work. What is the work of an evangelist? It is to publish, to proclaim, to prophesy, to tell forth the goodness of God and his kingdom in our world right here and right now so that people can know they no longer have to be bound by lives of sin, but they can have a born again experience with Jesus. Amen. Every one of us, can be preachers in that way, proclaimers of the good news of the gospel. And it says, I have been anointed to preach, proclaim the good news to who? To the poor. Now, poor is such a relative term because what one person thinks poor, another person thinks is wealthy. Just go to a third world country and you might think, well, you don't have a whole lot in terms of the millionaires and billionaires in this country, but by other world standards, third world standards, you are vastly wealthy. Did you have a shower today? Did you have shelter last night? Did you have a meal this morning? Are you going to have a meal this afternoon? Did you have more than one set of clothing to choose from to come to church? Or maybe you're sitting at home and you're still in the clothes from last night. That's okay too. You're in the presence, you're in the privacy of your home. You're still vastly more wealthy than third world standards. But Poor materially and, 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 and uh, financially is really not what this verse is summing up because it harkens back, if you recall, just a couple months ago, we were on the Beatitudes, the, the teaching of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, and the poor are those who are poor in spirit, Amen. not just poor financially. Now, there's no virtue to being poor financially. I have been poor, and then I've had a little more, and I'm going to tell you, a little more is better than being poor. But Jesus isn't talking strictly in terms of financial. He is talking in terms of those who recognize that they have a need in their lives that they cannot fill on their own. That there is this, this sense in which I've tried everything to fix my own problems and I cannot. And therefore, I am poor. I cannot get there on my own and I need someone to help me. I need a savior. And Jesus came to preach to those who recognize their need. There were a whole lot of people who never heard the preaching of Jesus. Why? Because they were already full of themselves. They were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were the, the ruling religious class of the day who rejected the message because they already had it all figured out. And Jesus said, well, I came for all of them, but if that part wants to just push me aside, if that part wants to reject me, I'm going to be there for the poor, those who are in need of God. Those who no longer have their fists so clasped like this that they can't receive anything, but the poor in spirit are those who change their posture and they have hands open wide to receive anything that God has for them. Do you want everything God has for you today? All you have to do is open up. He wants to fill you. And then he says, I am sent to heal the brokenhearted. To heal the brokenhearted. Now, in this day, they didn't know about the chambers of the heart that we know about today. In this day, there was no such thing as an open heart surgery. There was no such thing as a machine that you could bypass the heart so that you could do surgery and operate and, and, and do all the kind of things that medical science allows us to do today. So obviously Jesus must have been addressing a different kind of condition when he says, I've been sent to heal the broken heart. Jesus wasn't a heart surgeon, but Jesus truly is a heart surgeon. Because your heart is not that organ in your body that pumps blood throughout your veins and your arteries. A heart is the inner life. It's the innermost part of you. And when he says, I've been sent to heal the brokenhearted, he's talking about those who have been emotionally wounded. Those who have been broken through loss and through denial. 
Those who have been traumatized by events of life, whether it be in your family life, in your upbringing, in your spiritual life, those who you trusted have betrayed you and broken that trust. And Jesus said, I have come to heal that which ails you in the real you and to set your heart aright with God. And in the process, I firmly believe in the covenant of healing. I firmly believe that by the blood of Jesus, our literal organ in our body, our heart can be healed. But Jesus went beyond that. He went to the depths of our life. He said, I have come to heal the brokenhearted, the emotional, mental, and spiritually traumatized, to proclaim freedom to the captives. What was he talking about here? This is the gospel message. It's not just one part of the gospel. You have to take everything as a, as a lump, everything as a whole. And when you're proclaiming freedom to the captives, what you're saying is those who are enslaved by sin now have a pathway for victory or for freedom. You no longer have to stay bound, but some choose to stay bound. Some stay in a prison of their own making. I love how C.S. Lewis talks about in the, his book, The Great Divorce, he says that many will be surprised on judgment day to learn that the gates of hell are locked from the inside. That they could have easily turned that key and gotten out, but they have chosen to reject the Savior and to stay bound. And Jesus said, I have come to proclaim liberty to all who are oppressed through sin through being a slave of sin, through serving with their mind and their flesh the things of this world instead of the things of God. Now, just a couple months ago, we as a nation celebrated a, what is now a national holiday and should rightly be a national holiday, although it's become so politicized by the right and the left in our political systems that many people don't even understand what it is. But I think as Christ followers, we should do our due diligence. We should educate and learn our history so that we don't let bad history repeat itself. And if anyone should celebrate this holiday that I'm about to tell you about and explain just in, in a, a finite detail, anyone should, should celebrate this, it should be Christians. It should be the church of Jesus Christ. This new national holiday is called Juneteenth. Now, people have, have polarized and gotten on either side, but let me tell you what Juneteenth actually is. In 1865, right at, the, at the, 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 the height of probably the most contentious five years of our national history, right through the Civil War, in 1865, 2,000 Union soldiers arrived in Galveston Bay, Texas, with an announcement, or I want to say it, a proclamation that the 250,000 slaves in Texas were now free by divine but executive order. It was divinely announced by Jesus back here. This was God's intention all along. But it took the pen of an executive order of the President of the United States to declare that those slaves were free. They had already been set free months prior, but because of news having slow arrival in that day, they still were operating and acting as though they were slaves. Why? Because they didn't know that they were free. The truth will set you free, but it's not true. It is, you shall know the truth. And the truth that you know will set you free. If you don't know the truth, then you can still be bound yet having been declared free. And there are many people that you're going to encounter in your daily walk, in your office, at, at your school, and you go into your work. There are people who are literally slaves to sin, yet Jesus has declared them free. And so what does it take? They must have a preacher. They must have a proclaimer. Someone needs to tell them that they're free. Now, you can tell them to tune in to New Freedom Church, and they, we'll tell them here all the time they're free. But how about the testimony of a witness? Amen. How about one beggar telling another beggar where you can go to find bread? That's a whole lot more convincing than saying, come listen to my preacher on Sunday. Juneteenth is all about prisoners who had been declared free now getting the message that they are free. And if anyone should rejoice at that message, it should be believers in Jesus Christ because whom the sun sets free is free for keeps. Free indeed. And Jesus came to announce to those who were enslaved that they are now free. What else did he say? Recovery of sight to the blind. Now, this is both physical, because we know in Jesus' ministry that he healed many blind eyes. 
a, a literal person who could not see received their sight. But more than that, what did Jesus do? He gave sight to the spiritual blind. How many can testify that there was a time that you were blind, but now you see? You were lost, but now you're found. I think there's a pretty good song around the church that goes something like that. I once was blind, but now I see. Thanks be to God that Jesus came to give sight to the spiritual blind as well as the physical blind. And if you need recovery of your sight physically, Jesus is the answer. If you need recovery of your sight spiritually, Jesus is the answer. Ver uh, number seven, liberty to the oppressed, to the oppressed. You know, there are a lot of people who they just can't ever seem to get out of the cloud that's over their life. You, you look at the events of their life and it's like they go from one bad twist to another bad turn and, and nothing really ever seems to go right. And, and you, you really kind of, your heart goes out to them because you wonder, does anything ever good happen to you? And, and sometimes it doesn't seem like it's so. And they, they seem to have an oppression that's on them. Now, demon possession is real, but I think far more people are oppressed than are possessed. There is just this, this hovering cloud and almost like a compounding of bad decisions. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, you cannot save someone from their own bad decisions. You, you can help them and you should help them and you need to walk with them, but there is this oppression that sometimes just lasts and lingers because some people would rather be like that beggar outside the gate with the cloak identifying themselves as a beggar than to shed that thing and to be healed. That's just the facts. But Jesus came to declare and to set liberty for the oppressed. Acts 10 and 38 says that how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the power and spirit to go about doing good and to deliver all, somebody say all, all who were oppressed of the devil. And number eight is to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. I like how the Passion Bible says this. Today, these scriptures have come in front of you. They have come true right in your sight. The acceptable year of the Lord references the year of Jubilee, which in Jewish tradition, every 50th year, there was a canceling of all debts. You could get in debt for 49 years. You could sell your land. You could sell your family. You could sell everything in debtedness. But on the 50th year, all debts were wiped clean. The slate was erased and you are set free. And Jesus said, I have come in the full fulfillment of this text to be your perpetual jubilee. That from now on, all your debts are canceled. Your sins are forgiven and you are free. That's what he does. And this was so radical in their minds that Jesus said all these things. He sat down and he said that this was fulfilled, that they actually took him out of the town. It says they took him as far as the edge of the town and they wanted to throw him off the cliff. They wanted to kill Jesus. Now, I've been in a lot of church services where some of them don't go so good and some things you didn't like and the music wasn't real good and maybe you didn't like that traveling evangelist, but I have yet to be in a church service where after service, there's a mob outside that says, let's kill that preacher. And that's a dangerous church service. That's a dangerous crowd to preach to, but that's exactly what they try to do. And the scripture tells us that Jesus walked right through the middle of them. I don't know exactly how that happened. It must have been miraculous because they were intent upon taking him out for what they thought he was blaspheming, the holy word of God. But that's exactly what he did. The most surprising church service ever, that this man declares himself to be the Messiah, but afterwards a lynch mob is outside ready to kill him. Yet Jesus walked right through the middle of them all. So how does this apply to us? Well, the good news was extended, this gospel message to the 12, Luke, Luke 9 and 1 says, then he called his 12 disciples together. He gave them power and authority over all demons to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. Any place that you hear the proclamation of God's word to heal and that the captives are set free is an example of God breaking through in our day, breaking through in the earth. And mission creep is, is very real in organizations, but the church is not 
a regular organization. The church is an organism, and this mission did need to creep. This was a good thing that the mission went further and faster, and more people started to hear, because here's how it comes down to me and you. The same good news, the same gospel message, the same announcement in Luke chapter 4 has been extended to all of us. Let me show you how. Acts 2 and 38. Then Peter said to them, repent, let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What was the gift? The Holy Spirit. The gift wasn't tongues, though tongues is a gift. The gift wasn't prophecy, though prophecy is a gift. The gift wasn't word of wisdom, though word of, word of wisdom and word of knowledge is a gift. The gift that Jesus prophesied was the Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you're not lacking anything. Hear me. When you receive the Holy Spirit, you're not lacking anything. Amen. Don't let anybody tell you you're some second rate, third watered down version of a Christian just because you don't operate in a gift or a calling. God's gifts and callings are various. They're diverse. Not all of us have all the gifts, but all of us have the gift. If you said yes to Jesus, you have been born again by the Spirit. Amen. Not of your own will, not of the flesh, but by the Spirit. And then look what he says. Verse 38, 39. For the promise is to you and your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord your God will call. So the original audience was to you. So this was first century. This message that Peter preached was to them. And then he went on and said, to your children, and then to as many as who are far off. After 2,000 years, I think you and I are a little far off from that day, right? How many are glad to be a whosoever will? I'm glad today I'm a whosoever will to come into fellowship with the Lord. See, we as his people we are still on this mission. And we as a gathered assembly, a local community, we too have some core values, some components that are working our mission through clarity. And for us, it's simply the word free, F-R-E-E. -E. We're going to be faithful to the word of God. We're going to engage in relationships with God and others, fulfilling relationships. We're going to experience the presence and the moving of God in our midst and outside of these four walls, somebody say amen. amen. Church doesn't just happen in here. We are the church and we take God with us everywhere we go. And we should be experiencing God's mercy, his goodness all throughout our days. And then we're going to equip. We're going to equip one another and we're going to get involved where others are being equipped. That means giving to missions. That means putting our, our faith in action and actually going on missions and doing things of the gospel message, marketing, marching all throughout this earth, doing the things that he has called us to do. We, by doing that, will be a free people. So let me ask you, are you maintaining a faithfulness to the truths of God's word? Are you sanctifying the Lord God in your heart? Every decision that you make, are you balancing it based upon WWJD? I know it's a thing of the 90s, but I'm seeing these bracelets come back. What would Jesus do? I measure that by the word of God and what I know about Jesus' ministry. How about relationships? Are you a Lone Ranger Christian? Going to go it alone? Going to blaze your own trail? Listen, the first banana from the bunch gets peeled. You might want to stay in the group. You might want to stay connected to the source. You might want to have some relationships with God and with others that are fulfilling and that are helping you to gain wisdom, understanding, and instruction in this life, experiencing God, being equipped. The question is this. We know Jesus' mission. Are you on mission? Are you on mission? You see, the reason that this is the most surprising church service in history is because they did not expect that announcement. They had prayed for it, longed for it all their lives, and they yet did not expect that announcement. As they come and, and I get ready to close, I, I think that this message needs to speak to us something, that the good news will always be right, that love is greater than hate, that healing is greater than hurt, that freedom triumphs over oppression. You may suffer 
with rejection. You may suffer with being marginalized or sidelined, but the mission that Jesus came to proclaim and the mission that we are to also be bearers of is that the oppressed can go free, that that slaves to sin no longer have to be bound by chains which are invisible yet seen all throughout the decisions of our lives, that through Jesus, we have a jubilee, a canceling of the debts where the oppressed go free and healing for a brokenhearted. With heads bowed and you searching your own heart before God, I wanna give you an opportunity to do something today. I wanna give you an opportunity to say yes to the free offer of salvation to, by this Jesus, to say yes to a healing of a broken heart. You may say, Pastor, I, I've said yes to Jesus, but how about your heart? How is it on the inside? You may say, Pastor, I, I know that there's someone in my immediate circle that needs Jesus, and, and I would really like to have the church agree with me in prayer for them. And I'm gonna ask you, as these altars are open, with boldness and bravery, to step out of your seat. You can come right down here around these altars and pray, and someone, one of our deacons, our elders, they'll pray with you. Whatever you need from God today, today is the day. Now is the moment. Now is the time. You may not get another opportunity like this all week long. Now is the time. So if that's you, while they sing, I just want you to stand up, come out of your seat. Let's all stand together. Let's make it as easy as possible for people to respond. If you need to pray about anything today, come. These altars.